Welcome to the first edition of uh, AI Kenya Spotlight Series, where we hold conversations with startups and companies who are building AI and data science solutions locally in the country or who are serving customers locally in the country. So the main reason we have this conversation is we hope that through these conversations, our audience can understand the technologies, its implications, and benefits generally. So I'd like to introduce our first guests today, who are Utu. So our first speaker will be Bastian Blackenberg, who is uh, he's actually Dr. Bastian Blackenberg, who is currently the CTO at Utu, and he has a PhD in distributed AI. So welcome, Bastian. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, thanks, Alfred, for that intro. So uh, my own work in, in artificial intelligence uh, was, was back in Germany, where I did my PhD at the German Research Center for Artificial Intel Intelligence, or short uh, DFKI, which is the German abbreviation for the equivalent term in German. Um, that work was um, on multi-agent systems and particularly negotiation protocols. So multi-agent system is a system where multiple software agents or autonomous agents from independent uh, parties come together and uh, try to solve complex problems by working together. However, they are all also uh, rational, meaning they are trying to maximize their own profit and my work was concerned with uh, providing protocols for negotiating and in such a setting in, in untrustworthy and uncertain environments, looking at things like uh, incomplete information, risk bounding, um, trustworthiness of peers and uh, privacy preservation. And then I did an industry job in Berlin for a company called IVU, doing public transport planning software. Um, where I basically learned a lot about yeah, professional software uh, development. We built systems that is used by operators of bus and train systems basically to plan and run their network. Then 2014 moved to Kenya to uh, live here with my wife basically, she's Kenyan. And uh, that around that time I met the tech team of the startup Maramoja, which we then uh, I joined them as a co-founder because they were looking for a new tech lead. So um, the team was very young at the time. Um, basically, all people just right out of uni and uh, it's a bit challenging to build a production-ready system uh, without any experience in the industry actually. So, um, so they were looking for some help and I, I co-joined them as a, as a founder. And then we gave this up a little Kenyan twist, if you like, comparing it to other taxi apps like Uber or Taxify. We allowed clients to um, basically choose a driver and, shows the, and, and show to them at the time when they choose a driver, which is their own favorite driver or which is their Facebook friends or phone book contacts favorite driver. So in short, we implemented what we call a relation or personal relationship based uh, trusted recommendation system and doing that we realized that this sort of recommendation system is uh, also relevant possibly for other services like uh, find a trusted nanny, doctor, um, whatever service where trust plays a role and in fact um, if you ask around people who, who they uh, go to to find any services like that, make a decision like that, then you almost always get the answer that usually people um, trust their family, friends, uh, whoever, to, to give a recommendation. And this is now basically what Utu is all about. Um, so the overview I'm going to give on Utu is basically uh, sort of our pitch deck. We asked a lot of people about making choices 
how they choose uh, services, particularly when it involves any of your uh, personal health, personal assets, anything where trust plays a role. And the overwhelming majority of people um, trust basically known friends, family, whoever to, uh, to give a recommendation. And so the problem that we have then with current online services or marketplaces is that basically all of the reputation systems that are in use today, like the star ratings or the review systems or whatever, um, are based on transactional trust. Even credit scores uh, basically look at your transaction history and then compute some probability that you might default uh, something in the future. So they basically all miss out on this uh, human relationship uh, dimension that we think is really very important, and we are actually not the only ones who think that it's important. So this quote is from Eric Schmidt of Google, for example, which uh, underlines that this sort of uh, trust um, network or trust layer is really not something that is limited to one app or one marketplace. It's something that um, underlies basically the whole um, economy of online transactions or any transactions really, but in online transactions it's, it's obviously more um, difficult to achieve because we are not talking directly to each other, but over the network. So. Um, Uto's approach is now, we basically developed this very simple um, trusted recommendation service for the taxi app and Uto is now taking that and building it into its own product, uh, offering it as a service and uh, we are also adding a blockchain platform component on top of that to enable people to make staked endorsements of service providers. So. Instead of just favoriting a driver, you can now say, okay, I like this driver so much that you're actually putting 10 tokens on him and uh, then if that is a successful endorsement, meaning we show the recommendation of you to some of your friends and they take that driver and they also endorse them, then you will be rewarded according to the amount of tokens that the both of you staked and some other parameters. So what results is basically a, a graph that looks a bit like that, where we have service providers, we have clients, uh, some of them also might double in some rules, so your taxi driver might be a client of a hairdresser or something like that. Um, so, so we get that kind of network and different kind of relationship between people about yeah, what they like, what they don't like, how they are connected, Facebook, phone book, whatever, and other things that we might learn in the process of um, providing services and then hopefully getting feedback and that getting feedback is the other component of that platform where we also reward people for basically providing profile data. For example, you can nowadays uh, download all your data from Facebook and Google. You might encrypt it, upload it somewhere and then use our platform to manage access right to that data, saying, okay, that or that service may access the data in, in this or that situation. And when you do that, and they actually find it useful, meaning you don't provide fake data, um, then you will also be rewarded for that. But um, we might talk about these technical details later a bit. Um, so coming from the taxi up and transport side, um, we already scaled that up a bit across uh, Africa. So we have a couple of franchise partners who are using um, our technology in some other places like Ghana or Cameroon. And um, the thing is that we are often approached by other companies who somehow find us um, on the web and then say, okay, this model is really relevant in our place too. And so that just basically confirms our assumption that this is not only a Kenyan problem, but it's actually a worldwide problem. Although in the case of taxis, it's, uh, it's more relevant in some places than in others. So for example, uh, it's also very relevant in India, where there's a lot of um, crimes happening between drivers and clients. It's less relevant in the West, because uh, when you are in the places where Uber and Taxify were built, I mean, for them, drivers are just commodities. So. Um, they don't really care uh, which driver they get. Nobody in Germany stores uh, drivers in their phone books. So you just get anyone and there's not a trust issue. However, if you are looking at something like babysitters, then it's very different, of course. 
Um, now, practically, this is approximately how it might look. So our current taxi app looks a bit different than that, although similar in, in principle. But um, basically, the, the point is that we show these sort of qualitative statements about people that you hopefully know and trust recommending a service. So instead of showing you some number, like uh, this babysitter is trustable to a degree of 87.6%, uh, do you want to put your daughter's ha uh, life in her hands? Um, you know, most people cannot really make sense, make a lot of sense of such a statement uh, given, given such a number that usually is the result of some complicated computation. And if we show you instead that, you know, your very good friend so-and-so, who also happens to have a, a daughter in a similar age, really likes this nanny, then that, that's a much different um, statement that most people we find um, trust more. So in our taxi app, we already learned that we can increase some crucial business metrics with uh, using such uh, kind of recommendations so we can increase conversion, for example, and we verify that actually most people prefer to choose uh, trusted drivers like that over other drivers that are closer by. Um, also, we tend to get better star ratings. Uh, so star ratings and that favoriting are somewhat correlated, but they are not perfectly correlated, so we can also uh, talk about that a bit later. Um, <coughs> And then, yeah, as I mentioned, there are many other uh, possible application areas for this. There are also some other platforms who, um, who are working in the trust space. And uh, when you look at the two dimensions of whether a, tr um, a trust mechanism is actually a product or a platform, so a product means they have their own website, so you would go if we were a product, then you would go to U2.io and then try to get recommendations for services there. Whereas we think uh, that's usually not how people think, so they usually go to the website of the service uh, that they actually want to get, like eBay or Amazon or whatever, and um, or Uber, and try to get something there. And uh, then if there is to be a um, trust component that is not only limited to that particular marketplace, or up uh, to be included, then that needs to be served as a, um, yeah, as a service, as a platform component. So that's why we think trust is actually better modeled as an infrastructure um, approach. And on the other hand, we have this uh, descriptive individualized versus prescriptive trust. So that, that number that I just mentioned that gives you some degree of trust, that's basically a prescriptive thing because they give you a number and then maybe they tell you, okay, everybody above 90% uh, is trustable or something. Um, whereas descriptive and individualized means uh, it's actually broken down to your own personal situation and you can hopefully make better sense of it. Um, okay, that's more a slide for people who are invested, uh, sorry, interested in investing in us, but uh, just so you know that uh, that approach is actually getting some, some traction or at least some interest so far in the market is that we have been approached by a couple of different um, third party apps like a telehealth platform, actually two telehealth platforms, um, a mobile landing platform that's coming up and then other local services uh, that are interested in, in working with us. And just a quick note on the team. This is actually not the whole team. Uh, so the top three of us are the co-founders now of Utu. Um, there's also uh, one partner on the taxi side, uh, Ronald Mohando, um, who is, however, yeah, taking care more of the um, mobility side of the business. And then we have a couple of uh, advisors. So Professor Ramchurn on the lower left there is a former research colleague of mine on the, at the Uni of Southampton, with whom I co-wrote some papers um, some, some time ago when I was working on my PhD. He was also working mostly in trust models and later also in other aspects of AI and, and multi-agent systems, but also 
nowadays doing a lot of machine learning stuff or combining these approaches. So we've got a research um, partnership with, uh, with that group at Uni Southampton where Professor Ramchurn and a couple of his uh, colleagues are basically getting access to parts of our data, uh, basically an anonymized form of our DB, and use that to um, tweak their research to be a bit more you know, practically relevant, you could say, because that particular research area has always had the problem of um, using mostly simulated systems, not real-world data, because real-world data is really hard to come by for researchers if they don't work together with companies for particular projects. So we are happy to provide that. In return, we get hopefully tweaked algorithms that they are researching that we can more directly use in what we are doing. And then we have a couple of other advisors that are more uh, interesting to investors. Matt Papakipos is maybe interesting to mention because he's like a veteran in Silicon Valley. He basically uh, co-invented large parts of the GPU architecture that is used today by NVIDIA and others. Uh, he was also a technical director at Google and Facebook. And um, he, uh, yeah, he has really a lot of experience in designing complex systems. Anyway, so yeah, we have, um, we have quite a, a nice uh, network of um, advisors. Uh, these are not the only ones, as I mentioned. Um, there's another research partnership coming up with the uh, uni in India, but I'm also hoping to set up some more local partnerships. And that's basically our roadmaps um, very quickly. So uh, we are also, as I mentioned, designing a blockchain component for the platform. And we are also going to do a token sale for that. But um, given the current market, uh, we might actually shift this whole roadmap a bit around. So um, right now, we are concentrating on building the first really public API version of our service and uh, building out the machine learning components of it, which are basically tackling the, the question of who trusts whom for what service and what situation. Um, because so far, or well, in the taxi app, the, these recommendations that I talked about were a bit arbitrary in the sense that, okay, if a driver is recommended by five of your friends, then we basically just choose one of them. But there's probably more intelligent ways to choose which friend you would actually trust in a particular situation. So for example, if you are on a business trip, which we might figure out because it's a weekday, it's happening during the day, you are going from IHUB to uh, somewhere CBD, then maybe it's likely that it's a business trip and you might want to work on the, in the taxi with your laptop. So getting a comfortable car with a driver that has a comfortable riding style where you can work might be more relevant in this uh, situation then if you're in a hurry to the airport and you don't care for the comfort, you just want to have a fast driver who, who gets you there through the jam somehow. So, so that sort of thing is what we want to basically learn with um, machine learning and other techniques. And that's where my colleague Brian might uh, want to take over. Um, so Brian Muir is um, Utu's first real uh, machine learning engineer hire, and some of you might know him, I don't know, uh, he's quite active in the, in the Nairobi AI uh, circles, I would say. And uh, yeah, so he, he started looking into um, what we can use from our data and what methods, uh, or first of all, what, what kind of data uh, mangling and cleaning um, we can do, and then what, what sort of machine learning and other algorithms we can basically throw at it. So would you like to introduce yourself a bit more? Uh, hi. So my name is Brian Mohia. I, uh, I'm the machine learning engineer at Utu. Um, my background is in uh, mathematics and computer science. Uh, I worked a bit for consulting companies, which actually worked with IHAP Consulting. And then I, I worked in health informatics for three years. and then. Uh, uh, during that time, I was teaching myself uh, machine learning, uh, and now uh, I have uh, the responsibility of finding out how the different users in for different kinds of services recommend it, recommend services to each other, how trust 
of the recommendations evolves across uh, time throughout as they transact with each other. And uh, to maintain this uh, track record of people uh, and services that they've recommended to maintain uh, like a small list of services that a user can recommend to anyone else. It doesn't have to be just about drivers or nannies or anything, just really like a general sense of the kinds of things that one would be trusted to recommend. And it's really based on your experiences, uh, the kinds of things you evaluate. Yeah. So, uh, so our initial approach right now is uh, what's called content-aware recommendation. Um, the, some of the content here is in uh, the form of uh, his transactions, and it's also in the form of uh, social connections. So we sort of uh, combine the two and figure out what, which people to trust more for which kinds of services based on how they've used them and how they recommend. Uh, so as you can see, like, we want to build something which looks a bit like this kind of graph where user A, this is only about users, not about services. So one user trusts another user who trusts another user over and over and over. And the relationships are separate. So one, well, you can trust me for something without me trusting you for the same thing, right? And it, it, and it has many different dimensions. Uh, our machine learning system uh, is built on an internal API, which is constructed in Python. We have, uh, we basically do all our analysis in three systems, uh, Pandas, NumPy, and PyTorch. We visualize things using Matplotlib and Seaborn. Uh, the, data, the main structured data set is uh, uh, stored in a, a combination of MySQL and CouchDB or Mongo. Uh, and the external API is served through a uh, uh, fast Node.js uh, system. So, so that's the overview that we've done, that, that, that of the things that we do. And uh, some, some of the decisions may seem unusual. Uh, for example, why we use PyTorch. Uh, so this is like a technical detail, but I think it's pretty important given that a lot of people consider, uh, a lot of people in the machine learning space consider many other things before they look at PyTorch. Uh, and the reason is because uh, it works very well with other pre-existing systems, and you can move data to and from uh, uh, to and from these systems in such a way that you don't actually have to th change how you think about them. Um, you can you can do you can use it in the same way you use NumPy. You can do the same kinds of linear algebra operations using NumPy, and it's a very simple technique to uh, convert data from the processor to the GPU. Uh, and it's useful for parallelizing techniques uh, such as the, co the recommendation engines that we're going to build and neural networks. It's, it's very fast and it's very dynamic. Uh, so these are the resources that I've learned the most from. Um, over the past two years or so, uh, from uh, deep learning for coders, linear algebra, uh, computational. So these are the things that have taught me the most over the past couple of years. And um, uh, we can talk more about this later. Uh, I have so many, a world of things to recommend, and uh, we are sort of planning on uh, an event to actually go through a lot of these things together. And then for application to business, uh, you should probably look up a, a, a paper called uh, Rules of Machine Learning by, uh, by Zinkovich, which is used at Google as a, as a particular roadmap for them. So we can do a QA and a right now. Uh, if you have any questions about the, the technical side or the business side or any of the ethics involved in uh, combining social data with recommendation, I know a lot of you probably think about this a lot. So uh, let's go. Ask me anything. Uh, my name is Terry. I'm just a student. So I was interested in the trust uh, infrastructure, but I want to understand something like a house help. Uh, when we used to have an agency that recommended house helps to other people, one big concern was, I don't want a house help who's worked for me going to someone else's house and then exposing everything that we know, like talking about my private matters or you know who comes to visit me or you know what do I own in the house. So my question is, uh, where do you draw the line in terms of saying, uh, this person is recommended by, let's say, a level one or two or three of your friend, depending on how close you are, without revealing who exactly has recommended. So people would be more open to getting a house help without worrying about that person going and exposing their personal information. 
Great, thanks. Yes, very good question. Um, so that's why we basically want to build this uh, whole data provision and access control, uh, sorry, access rights control mechanism onto our blockchain platform, which would enable people to define very uh, specifically what, what data points, including endorsements, like, uh, okay, I, I endorse this uh, house help, but um, I don't want to be uh, named by name when, when this recommendation is shown to anyone, basically. Um, so that's exactly why we want to do that uh, in this way. And um, so some of my own research has actually looked into how to anonymize uh, to a certain degree things like that. So for example, instead of showing a, a recommendation like, uh, okay, your friend David recommends this house help, you would show something like, one of your very good friends uh, recommends this house help, and then it depends on how many very good friends you actually have, on uh, what what degree of anonymity you would have in that instance. So um, that's uh, something we need to figure out how to basically maintain over time. So in my own research, I looked at this kind of situations where you have like one shot situations. So if you have uh, only ever one kind of recommendation like this happening, then just counting the number of friends will give you a sort of degree of anonymity. But if you have repeated transactions, then you might actually learn something over time. I mean, that's how, um, I don't know, the NSA and other services uh, figure out who may, may be the owner of a Bitcoin wallet or something, because the the ID might be anonymous at first, but if you track transactions over time, then you might need to, uh, then you might be able to conclude uh, who is actually behind it. So, so that's one aspect of it uh, that we need to uh, look more into. Like, okay, maybe at some point we cannot show any more recommendations because giving out any more information would reveal um, who is actually behind it. Uh, that will be definitely a quite hard problem to solve, but uh, with the, yeah, there's research in, in cryptography and anonymity uh, and, and generally security that uh, we hope to use to, um, to be able to guarantee some, some form of that. I mean, whether it's perfect or not, we don't know yet, but um, I think we have some, some, some points of attack there. Then the other issue that you mentioned that you don't want actually your nanny um, or your house help to then later work elsewhere and talk about what she experienced on your house. Well, that's something that a system like us can simply not guarantee or actually no system. I mean, the only way to guarantee that your help doesn't go elsewhere and doesn't talk about you is basically to keep her a prisoner, I guess. Because, I mean, even, even if we don't recommend her to anybody and but she might still be able to find a job and you will never be able to um, you know, prevent her from talking whatever. So that's more of a social problem that, uh, that we cannot really solve on our platform, but neither can any other recommendation platform really. Well, I mean, you could imagine something like a sort of negative recommendation, like, um, okay, you don't want the house help to work for any of your close friends, because uh, you are afraid that she might talk about something there, so you say, okay, you, you recommend it to everybody except your close friends or, or people who you don't know, actually, because to those people, you would only be a random stranger and, and you might not care so much what she's talking about there. Um, so that, uh, that might be a way. Um, and actually, we thought about doing such kind of negative uh, recommendations in in maybe a similar context where uh, about about uh, doctors, so we mentioned this uh, telehealth platform that's interested, and there you have a similar problem because you might, um, I don't know, you, you maybe you have a specific illness and that requires seeing a very specific type of doctor, and uh, you would like to make a, re a recommendation for that doctor because you like them, but you wouldn't want any of your friends or your colleagues or your boss, whatever, to know uh, that you might have uh, that illness that is associated with seeing that kind of doctor. So, um, so in that case, you might also want to, to give a sort of um, 
recommendation, but but then show it only to people who who you don't know or who don't know you uh, more more precisely, or yeah, or some sort of anonymity. So, um, but yeah, that's that's probably the most uh, tricky part of our system. I agree. Mine is like a recommendation on that part, which you said um, it's a bit difficult to implement. I guess you can have like a question and answer mechanism whereby during the recommendation, instead of just saying I like, I'll recommend this nanny to you, you can fill out um, a questionnaire, like a questionnaire, which is like, um, instead of just saying a recommendation, saying I like this nanny because of one, two, three, it will be like in a rephrased questionnaire, one to 10 questions. Then from that, you can choose from in a scale of one to five. How does, how does she handle you, or how does she speak about her previous experience? Do I, am I making some sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Um, yeah, that touches another um, aspect of this uh, whole thing. So, uh, yes, we need to get feedback data, and we need to get useful feedback data. And then you could uh, go ahead and throw a lot of very detailed questionnaires at people after they used the service to find out how they liked it and what aspects they liked about it and what they didn't like about it. However, if you uh, show people like huge questionnaires like that, okay, I don't know how, uh, how you feel about it, but when I get this kind of, uh, you know, please answer this uh, survey for us so that you have a one in 10 billion chance of uh, winning a pencil or something. And then I'm given like a questionnaire with 50 questions. Uh, then I just think, you know, whatever. Um, and I'll do something else, right? So, um, so the trick will be to figure out what exactly is really important for that uh, kind of service for most people and then give very focused um, feedback forms that are short so people might actually answer it uh, without being put off or thinking that takes way too long or whatever. And uh, also be very clear about it and then, yeah, we could, if we need, if we really need to figure out more parameters then we can reasonably ask of any one person to give feedback about, we can randomize it like, okay, certain set of people get this sort of questions, another set of people gets this uh, sort of questions and then make the UI, well, fun, basically. So one of our ideas for doing this is gamifying the whole thing. Um, so when we talk about we are building a blockchain platform where we tokenize trust and we have this uh, token representing people's participation in the system by making endorsements and providing feedback, then that sounds like a very dry sort of uh, maths-driven algorithm, which it is. However, it doesn't look, have to look like this to the users. So we can uh, build nice apps that look a bit like maybe some sort of uh, online multiplayer role-playing game that actually are employing a lot of similar concepts. And uh, most of these role-playing games are actually just mathematical models of stuff that people do. They get awarded points or credits or mo nowadays actually most games use multiple currencies. So, um, so that population that is playing those games is already kind of used to this sort of mechanism. And uh, what we can do is try to build our apps in a way that, uh, that hide the, 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 the complexity of the maths and, and the AI and all that behind it and try to just make it more fun, you know. Yay, you have earned so many tokens today. Just answer these three questions and you have a chance of uh, increasing that by whatever and um, things like that. So, so that's the, the lines we think along. And uh, in that regard, uh, we also have a very good uh, visual designer and um, she's um, yeah, driving us very hardly to always uh, yeah, provide screens that, that look great and stuff. And, and that actually plays a bigger role than many like, core developers think. Um, but it definitely does make a great difference whether you implement a system and it works, but it doesn't look good, uh, then actually many more like normal people will not be 
very willing to, to actually use it, whereas if you manage to build a very nice uh, UI around it, uh, and UX also, um, then that might change. So yeah, that will be another of our great challenges to build such a front end, basically, or front ends um, that people will actually like to use and then provide us the data that we need. Yeah, my name is Jarono Odiambo, and I have very random or weird questions. First, I wanted to know which school, because he didn't talk about, you talked about your education. He didn't exactly say which school he was in, and I hope you studied in Kenya, yeah? Yeah, which school were you? Uh, Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, yeah. So that's good to know, because it's a bit more relatable. Then another thing I wanted to ask is, why did you call it Utu? Especially knowing that it has a Kiswahili meaning for uh, like Kenya in Kenya. And another thing is, how long has it taken you, like from conception to where you are right now? And also, basically, what they picked out were challenges they saw when you were like when you were trying to bring this about. So we'd like you to talk about, or I'd like you to talk about, like mention challenges that you people have met across the way, and also how you you solve them. The main reason why I'm asking this is because most of us, especially females, people assume we're not um, pro-tech or pro-AI, but we have very many ideas that are a very emotive based in the sense like most of the things we do are based on um, recommendation. Where are you getting your nails done? Who did you go see? Where are you getting your hair done? Everything we do is based on recommendation. So also, I'd like to know if I was to start something, most of the, ch um, the challenges I'd meet on the way and how I'd solve them, just basic ones. So thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, was the first question about how long did it take us to get where we are from the conception, or was there? Oh, why we call it Utu, yes, right. Um, yeah, so, okay, the three founders of us are all um, Zungu, but nevertheless, we are a local company. I mean, we founded Maramudra here, and we grew it here, and also, basically, all of the other team is Kenyan, and um, and also, this this way of trusting drivers, or not trusting drivers, and, and storing drivers in phone books, that's also something that came from here. So basically, we like to think of our company as something that evolved through this uh, trust problem on the taxi side and then grew from there. And we don't think we would have gone in this direction at all if we had not been actually here and, and done it here. So I think the whole concept is very much a Kenyan thing now because it really grew here and that's why we wanted to call it Utu. I mean, Utu as a meaning humanity, is uh, of course behind what we think the, the core of our mechanism is, which is the personal relationships between people. So we like to think of it as a more people-based approach than, than some other AI approaches. Um, so, so that's the, the reason for that. And that also ha answers half of how long did it take us from conception? Well, we didn't start out with a master plan for this trusted API. It was as I said, rather growing out of the taxi side of things, where we built a very simple initial version of this. And uh, getting there from having the idea initially, okay, when I joined the team, uh, they already had this idea, but they didn't quite know how to build it. Um, so that maybe then from me joining until we actually deployed it, and then adding the time that they had the idea, maybe that took a year or so. Um, although it's just eyeballing it from my memory right now, um, then the idea of breaking this off into its own product and basically founding a new company for that and all that, that uh, took then much longer. So the first version of the Trust API, which was internally used in the taxi app, that was maybe developed in 2015, end of 2015-ish. And now we are just in the process of building the first really public usably, uh, usable version of the, of the separate trust API proper, if you like, but we actually, yeah, we are in the design process and we implemented the first stuff for this, but we haven't deployed it yet. And these partners are basically now pilot clients who are coming on and which are also getting, um, of course, uh, very good conditions from us because for us, they are not only clients, they are also now partners who 
help us shaping and building how the API should actually look and work like. And um, so if you are um, willing to build a app for hairdressers or nail, whatever, then that's actually a great thing because we actually think that the hairdresser uh, use case is one of the best <laughs> that we could uh, right now find. Um, we just haven't found a third party app yet that, uh, that builds a hairdresser platform for Kenya. I think there's something there. So if some of you uh, feel inspired, then please go ahead and talk to us. <laughs> um, yeah, so I hope that more or less answers your question. Oh, so you, you then ask, okay, uh, what, what kind of challenges do you expect? And most of the challenges are really um, business challenges at first because uh, to, to run a company like that, you will probably need to hire people uh, or okay, you can also have a set of founders of, who, who work on it for a while without being paid or whatever. But um, if you try to build something like that, trust API um, from scratch, then it will be very difficult because you don't have any idea yet how it should exactly be built. So that is really useful for other services. And, um, and also you will have a bootstrap problem with the data if you try to add something like those machine learning components on it. So where will you get that from in the first place? And that's where our taxi app history really helps us because we grew that service and then from there we are building this trust uh, engine, meaning we already have a data set of Nairobi clients um, which are many thousand people who have actually more than, uh, okay, I didn't really look into the graph lately, but probably ar along the lines of 120, 250,000 relationships between each other. So that gives us a head start of then now building the, uh, this sort of service. And if you don't have that, then, yeah, then it's very difficult. So you probably need to look for partnerships uh, with other apps or whatever. And, uh, and then if, if you want to do that successfully, then you need to convince them that you're actually worth doing that. So first of all, they need to think you're serious, which requires that you actually are serious, but you also need to sell yourself as such. Um, so there's uh, yeah, basically the whole uh, issues of when you're starting a startup becomes relevant and that's really a bit out of scope uh, of this discussion. The technical side is challenging but, um, but you can really only tackle that usefully when you sort of get, get your things sorted out on the business side as well. Uh, mm, so the challenges to expect are, well, I'd like to go a little bit more detail on the business side of challenges because the thing about uh, systems like these, or basically any system which involves um, fast, basically building a kind of a market, is you have to solve a double-sided problem. You have to find uh, sufficient service providers so that you can attract clients, right? So like you have to, you're, you're basically selling to two separate groups of people, right? And the the most effective way I've seen this happening over time is basically find the biggest service providers and sign them onto your platform so that they can work together and color and. Even if they don't want to share data with each other, they at least have an, an idea of um, that they're actually in the same system getting the same kind of value. Right? So they, they bring their, their own competitive dynamics to the system that you're building. Right? Then the bigger ones attract smaller ones, and they attract their own clients as well. So that's usually how to start things like this, like two-sided markets. But uh, other, other sides are uh, team building is uh, definitely a huge challenge because uh, well, first of all, you being able to know when to trust someone's uh, uh, projected capabilities at the time when you're interviewing them versus learning about how they work over time uh, versus the, pro the challenge of the fact that you're learning and how to work with them over time means that you're closer in a way. So it gets harder and harder to uh, make difficult choices over time. So uh, that's, that's like, is that as far as team building is concerned, that's like the biggest one. And then the business building side, the biggest challenge is um, how, to, how to attract both sides of uh, a double-sided market. Yeah. I hope that answers the question that you asked. Okay. Yeah, maybe I just might very quickly add, uh, I don't know if you've heard about the Lean Startup 
I mean, nowadays it's such a ubiquitous strategy for startups that I usually tend to assume that everybody knows it, but if you don't, then read either the original book, The Lean Startup, or actually I like this one better. The idea is that you start with something small, uh, you just test out your initial idea in a very, in its simplest form, maybe it's not even building something, just building a prototype or whatever, like uh, Dropbox did, for example. They didn't build, build Dropbox in the beginning, they just put a website there and a download button, and there wasn't actually anything behind that download button, but they counted the clicks of how many people actually would download something like that, and then got a verification that, okay, it's actually quite a number of people who would be interested, so that's when they then started building the product. So try to find um, a way of having the most simplest form of what you envision to do and then build something that's able to verify that form called a, min a minimum viable product or MVP where product doesn't really have to be something real, as I mentioned, can be just something, yeah, a demo or whatever, something that is able to, to verify or, or disprove your, your assumption that that is something that um, people or businesses or whoever you're trying to sell to would like and then and then iterate from there. Always doing the minimal sort of work. Yeah, so I have a burning question. Can you talk about the um, experience at the Zero AI Accelerator and what were the main points that you can share with uh, the Kenyan space? Yeah. Sure, okay, so for context, um, Utu has been earlier this year accepted into a AI startup accelerator program called Zeroth.ai in Hong Kong, and it's been the third cohort this year. Um, so that program, I don't know how familiar you are all with like accelerator programs, um, but usually, traditionally, uh, accelerator programs for startups give you some training or teaching or mentoring and they require the founders or the whole company to move to the location of the accelerator and also also possibly pay some fees. Um, this is all not true for Zeroth. Um, they are more like uh, of the philosophy, okay, the company should stay where they are and then they have an on-site program which is like two weeks in the beginning and then two weeks at the end, and then three months in between that can work uh, remotely. And, um, and it also didn't cost any fees, but it came with uh, investment of $120,000. Um, so, so we made it into that. Um, I can recommend it if you are running an AI startup. It's really high quality. They connected us to a lot of very high profile uh, people in the industry to, to talk to. Uh, like have one hour long chats with them. Um, so I can only encourage you to apply to that at some point. Um, it's not easy to get in, so they have an acceptance rate of, I think it was 4% or something like that. Um, now what we learned there, well first of all, I personally didn't go to the first round of on-site um, um, meetings and trainings and stuff, so, so Jason did that, uh, who's unfortunately not here, but um, he said it was pretty awesome, uh, great people who talked a lot about uh, yeah, mostly business strategy and stuff, but there are also, of course, uh, very high profile technical people there. I mean, if you have such a low acceptance rate and AI-focused startups, then naturally you will meet a lot of um, yeah, very high uh, level, I mean, not necessarily well known, but, but very clever AI people. And uh, some of the other companies um, were, for example, a, a Russia-based, um, yeah, it's, it's an ad targeting company, but their AI um, methods were really quite sophisticated, so they used psychological models to figure out how people, how different people think, and then, um, and they're not only using like uh, brute force data approaches like the typical ad targeting of, of Facebook and, and so on, but um, actually try to go deeper into the uh, psychology of, uh, of, of clients and stuff like that. Um, then there was a, uh, another interesting um, 
a startup that is developing a, a blockchain-based uh, sort of speaker, so kind of an Alexa, but with built on a blockchain platform and uh, without a huge company behind it controlling everything like uh, Amazon. And I mean, most of these companies, uh, when I'm a bit vague about what they are doing, that's because um, most of these companies are actually pitching or have pitched since the start of the program in, uh, when was that, March until now, maybe, I don't know, two or three times. Um, most of them were newer than us, so they were still in the process of figuring out exactly what they want to do. So, for example, this uh, speaker would start out as a music platform, like distributed music platform thing where people can basically directly reward musicians or composers for the songs that they hear. But the latest thing I know that uh, they wanted to do was basically a um, yeah, speaker-based e-commerce uh, platform, more like Alexa, where you can order stuff, be it music or other media or anything else. So um, it's quite normal for, for startups to, to pitch a lot in, 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 in that sort of stage. Anyway, so some of the people we got to talk to include, for example, uh, Trent McConaughey, who's uh, building a um, AI data provisioning a blockchain platform called Ocean Protocol. And he has a background in evolutionary biology, or, and uh, sorry, evolutionary uh, algorithms. I mean, yeah, also in biology, but then also in algorithms. And um, so, I don't know, are you, who's here familiar with evolutionary algorithms? Anyone? Uh, okay, Brian. <laughs> okay, uh, so the idea of evolutionary algorithms is that uh, you encode the strategy of your algorithm in some sort of uh, binary uh, field or string or it's something you can kind of view like a DNA, if you like. And then you use that to define what uh, the algorithm that you are trying to build is actually doing and then you measure the success of that so, for example, if it's a classification problem, although that's not typically the, the main class of problems that is used, but it's uh, familiar for most machine learning folks anyway. So, um, so you, you run the algorithm, you measure the, the outcome, and then you, uh, like in biology, basically you do some mutation, so basically some random changes in that DNA, and uh, you also do um, well, reproduction by taking some other successful incarnation of your algorithm and uh, sort of pairing that uh, with the current one to get a new DNA and then you test that one and then you do that recursively to hopefully arrive at a, at a version of the algorithm that works well. Um, and they adopted this basically to um, analyze the behavior of their blockchain platform. So the blockchain platform um, the, the purpose for that blockchain platform is to uh, provide uh, data for generally AI and machine learning algorithms. So the idea is to break the monopoly of the big players like Google and Facebook and stuff to, you know, they already, they have all the data and they are the ones who can run all the learning algorithms. And uh, the idea is to democratize the whole thing. So similar to our platform a bit is the aspect that people should be able to provide data to the platform and then be rewarded for, uh, for that. And then other, on the other hand, um, AI or machine learning implementers to access that data, pay something for it, um, and, uh, yeah, and then do the, the learning, whatever they want. Um, there are some differences in the details between our platform and their platform. So in our platform, we focus mainly, okay, first of all, on our own service, what we want to learn, but then also the services there, we will um, require them to adhere to all these uh, access rights and stuff that we are building into it. And also the reward will be basically based by a service like ours saying, okay, this data was useful, so therefore we give good feedback to the one who provided it, which is then the basis on which they are rewarded. Ocean Protocol works a bit different. They have what they are calling um, curation markets where we basically have third parties that verify the, um, 
the the goodness, so to speak, of, of data. Um, so whether something uh, is fake data or real data and stuff like that. And um, their approach is a bit more general in terms of usage, but it also has some more assumptions because uh, in, in our platform particularly, we don't think that uh, third parties should easily have access to uh, have access to any of the data that is provided there. So anyway, different philosophies. But coming back to that whole evolutionary uh, algorithm thing is that if you're designing a blockchain platform like that, then what you are creating is a sort of economy where a certain good uh, or asset is traded, and in this case, data and against tokens, and that creates a sort of marketplace in its own. And you want to incentivize people or nodes to behave in certain ways. So in case of Ocean Protocol, you want people to provide data, you want verifiers to verify correctly, you want consumers to access the data and handle it correctly and pay for it correctly. So, um, so it's a sort of economy. And when designing such systems, then it's often not obvious how to design the rules so that the players in that platform are actually incentivized to do what you want them to do. And, um, and then their idea of basically building a sort of simulation system based on evolutionary algorithms is OK. They encode the, the rule set as a DNA. Then they run simulations, see how the system behaves. If it behaves in a way that they want it to behave, then that's great. And then they go on with from that one. If, um, if nodes start doing something else because it's more uh, beneficial for them to cheat or to not participate or whatever, then that needs to be mutated and um, yeah, and then try something else. So, so that was really interesting. Uh, we are actually using some variation of that approach for designing our own um, system. And uh, yeah, uh, game theory also plays a great role in this whole thing, anyway. So another um, guy we talked to in the Zeroth program was called, or is called uh, Ben Goetzel. I know that name might tell some people something. He has been director of the Singularity Institute formerly and is now working on another blockchain platform called Singularity Net, uh, in, in also in Hong Kong. and. Um, Singularity Net is sort of the, uh, the other side to Ocean because they are trying to bring AI and machine learning algorithms themselves onto a blockchain platform or basically distributing the computation of all that uh, and then use it utilizing a, a blockchain platform to, to, to do that. Um, so I'm not really sure how long it might take for that platform to take off because I think it's quite, um, yeah, it's, it's quite an ambitious goal. Uh, there's really a lot of technical issues and generally issues uh, to solve. Um, but for sure, it was a very inspiring uh, discussion. So yeah, anyway, and then after all, we came back to Hong Kong for the last two weeks of the program just in the run up to the demo day that was mostly focused on tuning the pitch deck and how to talk to investors and stuff. Um, so we learned a lot there. Um, though my own part, yeah, I was trying to focus more on the technical aspects of everything, but we were just uh, getting the first, per, uh, first version of our white paper ready to publish and was really valuable. To, to be there in, in, in Hong Kong and talk to all these people because even though it's an AI accelerator, uh, all of them are basically also blockchain enthusiasts. And uh, yeah, Hong Kong is one of the best or one of the most active places in the whole blockchain space. So um, it was really quite uh, incredible which, what, what people we met there and what we could discuss. So that was really great. Um, learned a lot. Uh, Zeroth itself. The partners are cool. Um, it's uh, the main partner is uh, Tak Lo uh, himself. Um, yeah, quite experienced in the whole AI startup space, although he is uh, not technical himself. Then there's Rodolfo Rossini, who's actually yeah, one of 
a sort of semi-prominent figure in AI landscape. He has a sort of half technical background. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter and, uh, and he has uh, usually quite a lot of useful things to say. Um, Sherman Lee uh, is more like in the blockchain space himself than AI, I would say. He has got a column uh, on Forbes. Um, don't, though I don't remember the name of the column, but if you Google Forbes Sherman Lee, then you will find him. Um, so yeah, I think Zero definitely has been a great uh, experience for us, not only because of the investment, but also because of all these great uh, connections we made there. And it's also left an impression with others. So when we put out our first version of the white paper, um, we got contacted by uh, Eternity Ventures. So Eternity is another blockchain platform, uh, general one that's trying to replace uh, Ethereum as a general smart contract uh, platform. And we had met their team, or part of their team, first in Nairobi here when they came to the World Summit um, blockchain in March also. And then I had put some intro of ourselves onto their forum. And uh, yeah, when we were just finishing up in Hong Kong, basically they, they contacted us because of that and invited us to apply for their own incubator, um, which we did and which we also got into and where we also got investment from. And, um, and they were really impressed with us being part of that Zeroth. So um, yeah, I can only recommend Zeroth in short. <laughs> Uh, how does your trust infrastructure apply on P2P e-commerce? How, 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 how do you implement it on P2P e-commerce? Um, yeah, I, th I would say generally it applies um, to peer-to-peer -peer transactions because um, it's not so much useful for, um, for classical business to, to clients uh, because it's about providing, uh, sorry, recommending specific providers to clients. So that's by its nature a sort of peer-to-peer -peer, um, system. And generally, if you have a system where peers can be both clients and providers at the same time, that I mean that that doesn't change it. That's uh, that's uh, that's just one more step into a true peer-to-peer -peer system. But the thing is, for us to serve the recommendations we need some sort of UI where we can do that. So that's why we target like platforms, like uh, our own taxi app first, and then um, yeah, that telehealth platform is for uh, finding health service providers for clients, or that peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending platform is uh, finding lenders for clients, so that's actually a peer-to-peer -peer system, even if uh, some of the lenders are mostly lenders and not borrowers themselves, and most borrowers are only borrowing and not lenders, but theoretically, each node could be both. So, um, so our system is really built for peer-to-peer, for -peer really. Hi, everyone. I'm Toby. I'm from same place. I'm Jaquad. Uh, so the first question I would like to explain about the AI accelerators. The second is, in your case, where you have said your, your friends have implemented the blockchain. How, let's say, customers have been paid either in what forum and also to the upcoming people, let's say, how are you focusing on the people on those sides, like in Rift Valley, those who have no idea that case? Uh, so an accelerator program in, in general is uh, yeah, a program that runs for a couple of months, usually maybe half a year or so, to help startups um, with typical startup issues, like um, how do you go about designing a strategy, um, what's, what should the roadmap be, uh, what, uh, how do you compute your financials, uh, all that stuff. So that's like the general accelerator approach, uh, something like uh, Y Combinator is maybe the most famous one. Um, so there are, there are better and worse accelerator programs. Um, we have only ever been to um, Zeroth, and then, yeah, okay, that, that eternity, that wasn't really an accelerator. It was more like, mm, yeah, what was it? 
um, sort of a, yeah, sort of a workshop series with 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 a pitching event. Anyway, um, so. I mean, Eternity was very good, uh, don't get me wrong, and, uh, but generally accelerators try to get startups from idea to uh, the first uh, small step of scaling, if you like, so uh, basically make you investable, and usually they end with a, what is called a demo day. So demo doesn't mean that you actually demonstrate your system, it just means that you're presenting a pitch deck similar to what we showed here, and then trying to convince investors to put money into your company. And usually the demo day itself is not where that happens, but probably in the run up to that, that's where you already generate hype and stuff. And, and the accelerator program will help you in figuring out what exactly to do, how you should design your deck, what communication should you do, uh, what channels should you seek to talk to, which kind of people. So Zeroth was just very focused on the AI part of things because it's particularly um, targeting AI companies, but there are others out there. Uh, I would just be careful with um, paying for such programs because uh, traditionally, I mean, there have been some surveys uh, showing that companies who took part in accelerator programs are not really, in general, more successful than others. So taking part in an accelerator doesn't necessarily increase your chances of success. It really depends on the particular program, but if you have to pay for it, then probably the chance is high that uh, it's just a business for them and, um, and they're not maybe so genuinely interested in the actual success. But um, yeah, in that regard, Zeroth was, was really good because yeah, it's basically free. I mean, okay, you have to uh, travel there or at least one has to travel there. Um, and I mean, theoretically, you could also do it completely remotely, but it's usually worth being there because the co sort of communication and insight you get by being there is generally much better than if you're taking part in such programs only remotely. So uh, I hope that that answers that for you. Um, the second question of friends building blockchain platforms and how you get into it. Uh, yeah, okay, that's. It's a really sort of wild field right now. Um, okay, right now it's actually on, on a sort of downturn because um, there's recently been a crash in the market for cryptocurrencies and at the moment uh, all the prices are down and, uh, and a lot of people who try to ride the hype are basically running away from it now, which others view as a very good thing because um, it means that or the fluff is being weeded out and, and the ones who are sticking around now are the ones who are really building something uh, for real. So um, we hope that yeah, it can recover in a more um, healthy way soon. So if you are interested in starting getting active in blockchain, um, yeah, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question because it really depends on what you know, who you are, your personality, um, and, and your goals on whether to decide uh, to, to build a real platform on your own or look, people, look for people who start building that with you or you'd rather try to join an existing project. Um, I mean, the, the completely Wild West era where everybody just started to rolling their own, I think they're a bit over right now. I mean, okay, if you just do it as a hobby or just do it for learning, then uh, why not build your own blockchain platform? Um, but if you want to be successful with it, then uh, yeah, because of the sheer number of platforms and actually really good approaches that are already out there right now, it will be more difficult than it was a few years ago to, to get something going in, in that sense. So the best thing you can do probably for most people is to look for others who are already active in the space and just uh, try to, well, if it's a company, apply. If it's a uh, open source kind of based group, whatever, then just join them, start contributing little stuff, very similar to joining an open source effort, basically. Um, 
there's also some places in Nairobi that I can recommend. So uh, Utu is running our own co-working space called Utu House. We call it Home of AI and Blockchain. And uh, we are co-hosting EOS Nairobi. So Rosalind just walked in, for example. She's working for EOS Nairobi. And uh, it would be a good idea for you to just come by and visit us, meet some of the people there. Uh, we just um, signed up some new members um, who are doing another platform called um, yeah, Pan-Africa Digital Assets. So they are in contact with the African Union to hopefully establish a Pan-African blockchain platform that will um, that will record basically asset transfers across Africa to uh, help fight corruption like in land ownership and, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, if you, have, if you have your own burning idea that is not being done yet and you know exactly, well, okay, maybe not exactly, but there's a lot of motivation that you have to, to develop something that's not yet there already, then I can only say, okay, try to find others to work with you on that. But even then, a good start would be to join existing communities because uh, that's how you would find those others to, to start something like that. So, um, I have a question for Brian. So what sort of instances of um, bias do you encounter when you are trying to train the model and how do you address that? Okay, so bias in machine learning models typically comes from uh, then there only being a small number of uh, targets for for a model to learn from and they're so small that they identify people or items in the data set that you have such that uh, what you get is that it became any decision that is made based on that model is actually completely imbalanced away from many different uh, people. Uh, an example for an example for for like a more familiar example is in uh, facial recognition. Uh, uh, the way this has come about globally is that uh, systems that are built by many different companies, including IBM, just do not know what to do with. Uh, faces of black people. <laughs> they just don't know how to recognize them. They don't know how to distinguish people. They just, you, you, yeah. So I anything that is built on top of that, uh, and actually pretty much all methods right now of building facial recognition just completely fail. And it's not just about collecting data. It's, it's actually like a technical mathematical problem. So uh, the, the, the thing about it is that it, it, it's usually based on the kind of data that you're collecting and it's usually based on the kind of problem you're solving. So for example, in this case, uh, our first, uh, our initial test case is uh, uh, ride hailing, right? So our way we're trying to solve the problem of bias is that, uh, first of all, uh, not all social relationships are relevant for all kinds of recommendations, right? And th there's, a, there's an even deeper problem that uh, even, when there's, even when they're relevant, you don't know when you don't know how so you don't know whether whether you should decay the relationship power for the recommendation so that it, it whether it's constantly important all the time to get the same recommendation for the same kind of service from the same kind of people all the time so things like that change and they have to evolve over time uh, and the the trick the tricky part about the solving that problem is that you ca if you only have one way to recommend a service, like you can only recommend a driver on one way because of the ride itself and you don't have any way to say what exactly you liked about it, uh, then you lose a lot of information and then uh, any of the reasons why you would, you'd, you'd refuse to recommend a service get lost in the wind. So bias comes from uh, lack of detail in data, it comes from lack of uh, diversity in data, and so, so one of the, some of the main components of this project is actually to increase the diversity of recommendations, the kinds of things you like about services overall. And uh, that should help with, the pro that should help with actually the, the particular bias problem of not knowing how 
to trust specific individuals and not knowing which of your friends should actually be trusted for certain services. Yeah. So thank you. I'd like, first of all, to thank Bastian and uh, Brian for that great presentation. Um, thank you for sacrificing your time to come and uh, sort of share, educate, and uh, motivate us to sort of understand artificial intelligence and the intersection uh, of how that comes into building trust infrastructure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, to that, uh, most of what we do is not totally selfless. Um, so Utu will also be hiring again sometime soon. And uh, we are going to need a lot of more AI, machine learning, and also blockchain developers. So um, yeah, if you're interested, keep an eye open. We might. Uh, we might post uh, something uh, sometime soon, but also email us. Um, okay, we didn't put our emails up there, but I think our Utu, yeah, Utu Trust on Twitter is there, and then you can email us at Brian or Bastian at Utu.io uh, if you're interested. I also encourage particularly the, the ladies to do so because um, you would also like to try and diversify our team more because most, uh, like most tech companies, we have a very abysmal um, rate of female to male developers and uh, would like to improve on that. So yeah, thank you all for coming and um, hope we can keep in touch. Yeah, and then I'd also like to thank uh, What's Good Studios for covering this event. So for the guys who came late or for the people who are not here physically, they'll be able to watch this event and also learn from it. And um, lastly, I'd like to thank iHub for hosting us in this amazing space. And um, that's it. So I encourage you to sign on to Meetup, um, follow us on Twitter, um, join our Facebook page and group. We have a page and a group for discussions. And then we also have our website, aikenya.io. So we'll keep having more guests. So. Thank you for coming today.